The picture. Yeah, every once in a while, yeah, my memory slips. Uh, so they're running out to go uh, get some of their office max. We just thought we'd shift things a little bit and we'll uh, take some questions now. And then I know Jerry's going to introduce me in a little while. And uh, Mark, instead of kicking me in the butt, if I hadn't been in the situation where, like in Nashville every Saturday night, you would go out there without ever seeing your opponent. You know, there were several venues like that. And uh, I mean, those matches may not have been masterpieces. But I, uh, I made mistakes every night, and I got chewed out for them almost every night, and it made me a much better wrestler. And uh, and so as time went by, I was like, you know, I don't think I would have been standing on that stage in Madison Square Garden being inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame had there not been some dressing down, and uh, had I not certainly had I not been through this area, there's no way anything that followed could have happened. So, yeah. Um, so, Mick, can you? I'll give you a three-part answer, okay? Terry Funk with an N, so I did not drop an F on the end. Terry Funk? Yeah, Terry's had a pretty tough year, um, but I think he's hanging in there. And it was really the matches that he had with Lawler at the Mid-South Coliseum that made turn on a light bulb uh, in my head. And I was like, I'm going to copy everything that guy does. <laughs> and uh, I loved that. So I loved getting in there with Terry Funk. Um, so Cold Steve Austin. Yeah. It was incredible because uh, you had a certain limit to where you thought you know your career could go and reactions that you got would go. And then I find myself on a nightly basis, like in '98 when that Stone Cold character took off, and every single thing I do is getting a better reaction than anything I ever imagined. Anything I ever imagined, and I I, uh, I wrote a, a column on uh, about Steve, and I said, you know, it was been said, has been said that some guys were so talented that being in the ring with them was almost like a night off. And I was like, with all respect to Steve, and that's Russell speak for him about to say something bad about the guy. <laughs> with all due respect, wrestling Steve Austin was never a night off. <laughs> and what I mean by that was that he pushed you every night. And he lit you up like it was the 4th of July. And when you were on the receiving end of those Austin comeback punches, it was no day at the beach. Then somebody goes, well, if it hurts so much, why don't you complain? And you're like, complain? And he's still called Steve Austin. Do you listen to that reaction? I want to be a part of that every night that I can. And it was a great honor to be out there every night. But I have to say, had it not been for The Undertaker, and the match oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In uh, 1996, I know we had the famous cell match in 98. Yeah. And, uh, I'm going around doing a one-man show based on that one match. Anyone wants to make the drive out to Nashville tomorrow? There's some tickets left. Huntsville, Birmingham, uh, and it's but it's because of the professionalism he showed in '96 that really put me on the map. And it, it, when Paul Bearer turned on the Undertaker, became my manager, we would wait and that, you know, that, that ominous gong would go off, you know, and we knew that every eye would be on him. And then Paul would roll up his shirt sleeves and he'd show me how the hairs were standing on end. And then I would show him. And every night, you know, there was never a night where we took it for granted, where we did not realize what a great honor it was to be uh, out there with him. So if I had to choose one, I would say it was uh, The Undertaker. Oh, yeah. Oh, Terry Funk. Rick Flair, yeah. Tommy Billington, the Dynamite Kid, unusual choice, wild card. Go ahead and Google Dynamite Kid versus Tiger Mask. All right, um, that's, that's three. Um, Shawn Michaels to me is the greatest wrestler of the current era. Current era described as guys who had um, 
uh, pay-per-view matches on a monthly basis. And you know what? For for staying in an area for 30 years or longer, which no one else has ever done, I think we need to put Jerry the King Lawler up there. Yeah. 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 And as I'm watching these things, I'm like, wow. I'm watching them like, no one threw a punch like Jerry Lawler. It was just, just phenomenal. Okay, we got some more. If you want to point out, I wrestled the next night. It was brief. And of all the craziness that ensued, uh, the one thing I can't get over is that after that match was over, I ran out in the main event. I wasn't running, you know. It was the most pathetic, limp stagger out. But I made it out there. Like, that was the one thing where I, I can't believe that they didn't go, you probably had enough at this point. But I was, I was hurting for many, many weeks, probably six weeks before I started to come around. So uh, it was a tough one. Don't do what I did then, man. Uh, okay. Tennessee, he's a WWE Hall of Famer. Let's play the music and let's make welcome Jerry the King Lawler. there by Randy, right? I thought he was going to have a stroke. <laughs> okay, listen, thank you all for being here. This has, been, this has been a great turnout, a great day, a great event here at the uh, Hall of Fame Bar and Grill. So excited that you all came out here today. And um, has everybody already had a chance to meet and greet and get autographed that picture weight with me, Foley? Very good. So I guess what, one thing, they also had a chance to do this. They, most of anyone here, King, has checked out the Jerry the King Logger beer today. Yeah. <laughs> I, did, I did an interview for the, for the newspaper today about that, and uh, the guy said, please tell me at least you're going to sample it or try it. And I said, I've never tasted beer in my life, and I'm not going to start just because they named one after me. But how is it? Is it, any, is it good? We got some right there. Jerry the King Logger. They've also got one. I think if you go back in, well, still today almost, you can go through the ranks of the WWE, and especially in the past few years, and look at all the top stars. Uh, like that wall right there, you can see. So many of the top stars in the WWE, like The Undertaker, started right here in Memphis, Tennessee, as mean Mark Calloway. Uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin started here in Memphis, Tennessee, as stunning Steve Austin. I mean, so many of the big stars that have become big stars in the WWE had some kind of experience here in Memphis, Tennessee. And this next guy is no exception. Now, I got, I got to be perfectly honest with you. My greatest memories of Mick Foley came as JR and I were sitting, or sitting next to the uh, ring at the announce table and watching, watching this man put his life and his limbs and, and his, every part of his body on the line, coming off the top of, a t of the cage with the, with the Undertaker, landing right at our feet. And I swear, I, I, I still say to this day, I think I said, he's dead. He's dead. And then all of a sudden, I looked down, and Mick Foley looked up at us, and he had a smile on his face, and his tooth was sticking to his nose. I mean, this guy has given us so many, so many unbelievable memories over the years. 
Uh, and I'm just proud to be able to say that he did, uh, you know, he did come through Memphis at one time, and and that's how we figure that he earned his place in the Memphis Hall of Fame. And um, I just want to bring him up here right now and induct him right now with everybody here into the 2018 Memphis Wrestling Hall of Fame, Mick Foley. Come on up here. Now, as I said, Nick, it was like when I when I just stand here and try to think of so many of the of the crazy <laughs> the crazy memories that you gave, especially me and Jr. sitting there watching you. Can you do? do is there any one of those memories to you that stand out above all the rest, or was it just such a blur? I mean, every single week this guy would put. I mean, go out there and do something. Insane that people would after the show would just say can you believe that Mick Foley just did that to himself? I mean just but is there any one thing that stands out to you? Uh, you know when you do things week in and week out, you right sometimes it, it does become a blur and you tend to remember The really good things that happen and the really bad things that happen like if you see what's known as like a curtain sellout which is all the boys and the women men and women all gathered together the curtain that means that there's a potential for something really great to happen out there or really really bad nobody wants to see anything that's in the middle so I certainly have some you know some things some times when things went wrong but I think uh, you know especially with you standing here that match uh, that took place in June of 1998 was such a phenomenon because it grew in stature and it grew at a time before there was social media and I think if it, there had been social media it would have been trending for three or four days, and they would have been on to the next thing. But when all this stuff went down, I had no idea that it had been augmented by what I think were the most, most phenomenal set of calls. Jim Ross with Good God Almighty, he's been broken in half. And, and King, yeah, when I got to, you know, when I came, I came through the second time, he said, that's it, he's dead. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. And, uh, and um, these things have become part of pop culture. You know, these calls have been part of pop culture. Um, but I'll go back to, I'm watching some of your highlights here. Oh, please. Uh, and I was like, this was the first time I ever saw the David Letterman show. Really? And so when something happens, you tend to remember exactly where you were, when it was. I was visiting my brother at um, Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. He went down to get the pizza, which had been uh, rated one of the finest pizzas in New York. And I watched the David Letterman show. And when I saw Jerry slap Andy Kaufman, I was like, I want to be like him. So it took me like 20 years to admit it, but finally I was like, King, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, when I was in college, I grew my beard like yours. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hello, brown I had the beard? brown thing going on, yeah. I've got some visual evidence that I'll show up there, but I was really fortunate to have been a part of some really cool things, both in WWE, but I look back on my Memphis days, and I'm the one guy who was like, I hated it there. I don't ever want to go back there. No, a lot of but, guys hated it here. But when I uh, when I look back, you know, it was even even when I wrote the book 19 years ago, I was like, ah, oh, Randy Hales, I'll get even with you, my friend, and your little dog too. But I, uh, and then uh, and then as you get a little older, you're like, you know what? I don't think I would have survived in wrestling if I hadn't been toughened up. Uh, and I, I'm kind of repeating what I said a little bit earlier that I tend to be a guy who does better with a pat on the back than a kick in the butt. <laughs> but if you, all you get are pats in the back, so you don't know what it's like to get a kick in the butt once in a while, you, you don't know the difference. And uh, I did, I did uh, respond pretty well. I thought I improved every week. You know, I took the advice that was given to me, and by the time we left, I thought I'd made a little bit of a contribution. Uh, and, and I. I didn't draw the type of money that guys here did. I didn't do anything socially significant like Sputnik Monroe did. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm going to proudly take my place as part of the Memphis Hall of Fame. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you.
Well, with that being said, let me go ahead and hand you this and induct you into the 2018 Memphis Wrestling Hall of Fame. Take a look at that. That is nice, huh? You know, in order for this, in order for this to have the feeling of a real Hall of Fame, we need to go another five and a half hours here. Oh my gosh. Was that not the longest Hall of Fame ever in the history of the world? Beautiful. Oh. But anyway, yeah, this, this is much shorter and much more to the point. And Mick, thank you. And uh, there you go, man. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jerry. I appreciate it. It's a great place to have out here. Uh, I talked to so many people came from, you know, within a few hundred miles or more than a couple hundred miles. There's somebody from St. Louis uh, showed up. Somebody from Ireland who stuck around after Mania. There you go. Australia. So, uh, yeah, we got the word out. You guys responded. Uh, this is really cool. And what it's really about is people uh, who knew each other kind of giving back. It's a, it's, it's a big dysfunctional family, but doggone it. We're still family. And thank you. And a young lady is going to get my name or catchphrase tattooed on her wrist. That's right. So, thank you. So, that's, that's dedication. Anyone can say they're a big fan, but you can prove it, ma'am. So, so, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mick Foley. Thank you. Foley! 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 Foley!